um, Zororo on uh, a that one. Yes, I'm taking our time to exactly 14 minutes after the hour of uh, 7. Like I said earlier on, we're going to be discussing um, the effects of climate change and the evidence thereof. And I'm joined in the studio by Shingi Nelson Machaka, who is um, from Sustainable Climate Action Trust, um, as well as uh, Tinashe Mangosho, who is also a climate ex- uh, climate change uh, expect. Um, gentlemen, uh, good evening. Good evening. Good How evening. Thank you. Uh, great to have you with us right here in the studio. It's a pleasure to be here with you. All right. So um, we have had stories about climate change. We've had stories about the effects thereof. Uh, but there's so many things to talk about when we talk about climate change. But perhaps let us start by understanding what climate change um, is. Uh, um, Tinashe. Okay, thank you. So in climate change, we are saying we are looking at the significant changes of weather over a long period of time. So this this period could be up to 20 or 30 years. It's quite a long period of time. And if you note, this climate change has been there, but now due to human-induced greenhouse gases, the changes are now significant. So it used to have a low range, a low frequency change. But currently, if you check the trends, there's a very high significant change. So that's what we are basically saying about climate change and looking at the attributes of weather, looking into humidity, rainfall, temperature, even the rain season, looking at all. Um, um, can you uh, break it down for the ordinary man in the street, Shingi? What, what does that mean? What is these gases that you're talking What exactly are you talking about in language that can be understood by an ordinary man? Because my understanding is that it doesn't affect those that can um, uh, fathom the words that you're talking about. It affects us all. Okay, so with climate change, how it affects an ordinary individual is back that we used to know the normal days or the average days where we know how, where we start our farming seasons. We usually talk about mid October. That's where usually our grandparents started to do the the cultivation of land. But these days, due to climate change, the patterns are shifting. Like Tinashe was saying that over a long period of time, things are changing. So here we are now in that period where things are changing. And now we are starting to experience the early rainfalls. They are probably coming probably mid-November or late November. So that's how climate change is, is affecting us in that aspect. Also, we talk of the increased uh, climate temperatures. We, we are now ex- experiencing a uh, higher or we are experiencing a long period of summer time with higher temperatures than we used to experience back in the days. So that's a bit on how climate change is affecting us uh, or to an ordinary person. Number one, the rainfall patterns as well as uh, the increase in temperatures. Somebody spoke about the extreme cold that we experienced yesterday. Has it got anything to do with climate change? Yes, of course. Uh, the Anything that is weather related uh, is also due to, to climate change. So the cold weather that we experience at the moment, yesterday, today, is also climate induced. As I was saying that back then, we usually know that our winters are more probably in June. But then with now climate change coming in, we are experiencing more of those uh, harsh cold temperatures late here in July and they are coming and they are being severe with climate change impacts they are really severe as back then where we experience rainfalls it's really severe rainfalls we experience high temperatures it's really high temperatures and when it's in in winter like this it's really cold temperatures so that's how climate change is really affecting us do you think society is aware of climate change and its impacts here I'm talking about the ordinary men in the street do you think they understand okay yes i think they understand but um with some limitations so if you look at the back of your garden when we are doing agriculture backyard farming you know that uh, the temperature is increased so it means the rate of evaporation for our vegetable garden is increased so we start to put in mulch 
So you see there's an element of adaptation and mitigation without knowing. But taking climate change as a context, I believe now people are aware though there is just a small limitation for them to fully understand because this is a process with a lot of scientific terms and jargons and a lot of interactive processes that happen maybe as an example if you look um we could electricity is directly affected by climate change from one aspect so if you look you see kariba dam at low le- low water levels so it meant that our electricity production it became lower so this was also part of climate change that was affecting us and if you look at awareness in the streets uh, on social media and even when you walk you see some people are away though there are few that are left behind but i can safely say the majority is away but the context is to be finer for everyone to be on board but there is a huge role that is being played by the majority as well so i can say yes people are aware of climate change uh, perhaps we need to drill down to the evidence that we can all relate to um to try and understand um the impact here in zimbabwe Shinki, are there any um other examples that we can all understand as the ordinary uh, men in the street Definitely, definitely. Like I was saying, with climate change, we then talk of extreme weather conditions. So, going back to the grassroots, or the main impact that we felt in Zimbabwe is the cyclone Idai. With climate change, we talk of extreme rainfalls, and with that cyclone, that was a huge. Uh, that's an example of, of climate change impact that we are facing as that we face in Zimbabwe. We are also facing since past years but 2020 2022 there was also droughts here in Zimbabwe so these are some of the impacts that are being faced here in Zimbabwe and these are being caused or are being related to climate change so here in Zimbabwe yes we're experiencing these effects of climate change as, as you were saying already that yesterday the the temperatures that we are now facing are extremely harsh they are now different from the ones that we are used to so yes climate change is here in Zimbabwe and climate change is real so we need to act you locked on to Capital 100.4 FM, Harare's heartbeat. We unpacking evidence of climate change in Zimbabwe. And my studio guests tonight are Shingi Nelson Machaka from Sustainable Climate Action Trust, as well as Mr. Tinashe Mangosho, who is a climate change expert. So you can also uh, take part. You can um, send in your questions. You can send in um, your voice notes uh, on our WhatsApp uh, platform. As usual, uh, the number is 0719-100-404. Stay locked on on Capitalk 100.4 FM. If yesterday didn't work out, we try again today. Capitalk 100.4 FM. Harare's heartbeat. Oh yes, it is Harare's heartbeat. We are unpacking evidence of climate change in Zimbabwe. And in the studio, Shingi Nelson Machaka from Sustainable Climate Action Trust, as well as Mr. Um, Tinashe Mangosho, a climate change expert. I'm always tempted to say climate exchange. I hope I don't (laughs) say that. (laughs) All right. Um, Shingi, there is much noise about mitigation versus adaptation which one should come first so prior to the previous days mitigation was mostly prioritized first to according or compared to adaptation because uh we are saying climate change is being caused by what by the the greenhouse gases that are being emitted into the atmosphere and through mitigation we then reduce those amounts of uh, greenhouse gases that's why it was mainly concentrated with that let's try to prioritize mitigation to adaptation but with the science that is being put on in the evidence through the the research that has been done there is between the two nothing should be prioritized more they should be worked concurrently together so that we are able to reduce those greenhouse gases as well as we are able to live and adjust our lifestyles that's adapting to to climate change so both should work end in the end not putting other on on top of the other without asking for your ids gentlemen i see you are um, in in your youthful years Mm. um 
what is the role of the youth in climate action? Okay, thank you. Um, I think to start off with our education in Zimbabwe, there's education 5.0. So I believe innovation should be one of the solutions that we can offer as youth in as much as we can have uh, access to social media and share the message. As you can see, even some clothing, you'd see them. Grow a tree, uh, don't just grow old. They show that there's a message that is there. So the youth, I believe, they can actually unpack the science that is there to ensure that we also correspond with the policy that is there and comply to ensure that we have sustainable development in the country or at home or as a nation. So basically what I can just say is the youth, they have to embrace the innovation platforms that are there and offer realistic solutions that will assist us. Because the role of sustainable development, if you look at it, there are three main P's. There's the profit, the people and the planet. So if you look you have to integrate this and the youth, they have the energy to run around, they have the energy to read, they have the energy to actually go and have a public awareness and all. So I believe the youth, uh, they are the future and they also assist in the current consultations that are being done in terms of climate change. I'm sure also evidence is young people who are here and are taking this issue. Mm. So yeah, we have a role to play. Yeah. Um, and Shingi, um, Tinashe mentioned um, the issue of innovation. Has there been anything innovative so far coming within the confines of Zimbabwe? I'm not talking about things that have been borrowed. I'm talking about what we've innovated here in Zimbabwe in response to climate change. I can simply say, to a lesser extent, there is some innovation that is being brought here in Zimbabwe. And with these uh, organizations or individuals that are coming up with these innovations, they are targeting Zimbabwe as a nation. In as much as climate change affects us uh, worldwide, but then how it affects us as nations might differ from Zimbabwe to, to, to Europe or Zimbabwe to Zambia. So there is need. Uh, for us to have innovations that are different and that are unique to our country and yes I can say there is there are some innovations that have been done here in Zimbabwe but they then lack some resources for them to, to be scaled up or for them to, to boost or for them to fit in accordingly so that they can grow so that everyone can understand them everyone can be able to use so that we can adapt or mitigate to, to, to climate change um, Tinashe, I, I, I like talking yeah. about what we call low hanging fruits. Yes. Okay, when I talk about low hanging fruits, these are fruits that you can pick without having to climb up the tree. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. What are the low hanging fruits that, in general, we can all pick? I'm talking about what action we can all take that is uh, action that doesn't take much effort, that doesn't need me to have many resources for me to take part in um, okay. this. So the first one will be tree planting. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. Because you can have your plantation, whether you are in the urban area, the rural area, if it is a small small plot or a large plot. So it means, for on the three pieces that I mentioned, on people, profit, and planet. So if you plant your orange tree at your home or at your rural area, it means uh, when you are in the COVID area, you would actually have those nutrients you would eat from the oranges then you can actually have, if you upscale it, you know, the role of trees is to have uh, carbon sequestration. They take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere when they through the process of photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So that's part of mitigation. But there's also adaptation in the sense that we get the fruit that we eat. And even, as we are saying now, there's less water. There's less water precipitation. So the rainfall is now lower. So when you have your trees, it means the, the, they give a route for water to go to the underground and they recharge your water table so that's another thing that you can have then another low hanging fruit you can do is just resource use efficiency when you see water running you just close it it means you need now you 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 actually lose out less water an example is on electricity there's a high efficient electric electric gadgets so it means the coal that is being bent in wange to power that um computer or whatever electricity that you are going to use 
if you an example is on switching on the lights during the day so it means that energy is excess energy being bent instead of being used to produce something it's just energy that is being wasted so if you have resource use efficiency you have high efficient uh, gadgets especially those with labels they show you a b c in colors red green and yellow they actually on the three p's so it means if you have more efficiency on your electricity you reduce your energy use by reducing energy use we are saying less core is bent and then you, you actually use minimum then for those who use solar we are looking now at the lifespan of solar then that's what i can basically say is low hanging fruits however there are others that we can use as awareness just by sharing the message you know even in churches these days they're talking about climate change because if you build something that is not climate proof you build with a weak foundation in an area that is a uh, soft soil it means it's going to affect you later on so if you not in other areas there are some areas where you see the roof is being blown off the roof is being blown off at times climate resilience would come also in the aspect of infrastructure so when you're building something it just has to be strong and you are certain because we're saying with climate change the climate hazards are anticipated to increase in frequency and intensity the floods are going to come the hailstones are going to come and increase even the cyclones are going to increase so that other thing would be adapting and the one of the lowest thing in fruit especially in the urban areas is your backyard cutting you actually reduce the carbon footprint for your food and you get it at a lower cost than going to buy your food somewhere else so these are some of the low hanging fruits that are there that one can actually utilize. Mm. Shingi, let me drag in this issue because I know that uh, it may have something to do with what we're talking about here. Mm. The issue of wetlands. Yes. Is there anything that they contribute to what we're talking about? Yes, wetlands are probably the second carbon sequestry in our atmosphere they absorb carbon dioxide and we are saying that uh, climate change is being caused mainly with the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere so with wetlands they did absorb that carbon dioxide that is in the, in the atmosphere thus minimizing the the amount of greenhouse gases that is in the atmosphere so wetlands they act as a measure to mitigate climate change so they need to be protected they need to be kept safe and they don't need to be disturbed since also those wetlands, they also there is also biodiversity that is there, and if we disturb those wetlands, we are saying we are also destroying our biodiversity, and uh, we then face some some impacts that we were not normally supposed to face since we are disturbing. So yes, wetlands they need to be protected and they need to be reserved as they are. Uh, thank you very much. You tuned in to Capital 100.4 FM and we're discussing, we're unpacking evidence of climate change in Zimbabwe and talking about what we can do, you and I, what we can do um, in the back of, back end of your home, in your rural area. So stay tuned, stay locked on on Capital 100.4 FM. <laughs> It's happiness all day long on the happy station. Capital 104 FM. Harare is heartbeat. You still locked on to Capital 100.4 FM, Harare's heartbeat. The show is the exchange and we are unpacking uh, the uh, evidence of climate change right here in Zimbabwe. I'm joined uh, by Shingi Nelson Machaka as well as Tinashe Mangosho, who are climate um, experts. Now, gentlemen, let's turn to uh, the nation at large. Um, is Zimbabwe doing enough um, in this fight? Uh, I believe we can say yes. So if you look in Zimbabwe, the government of Zimbabwe formulated the Climate Change Management Department to deal with these issues. Then there was the national climate policy that was done so that the government shows uh, its commitments into what it will do. It later on signed the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement is a worldwide agreement that was done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fight climate change. Then adding on to that, there was what was called a nationally determined contribution per country. So each country estimated uh, using the scientific models you, from the business as usual to the expectations of the country up to the year 2030 
then from those models each country was told to actually work out how much emissions do you want to reduce then zimbabwe submitted the nationally determined contribution to reduce the emissions by 33 percent below the business as usual scenario by 2030 then adding on to that you'd see that there was the what is called the low emission development strategy which was taking the four key sectors for climate change to account and ensure that we are able to develop as you develop the country we're actually reducing our emissions at the same time so it's called the low emission development strategy that was basically mitigation to reduce emissions but now in 2021 if you look even the there was the conference of parties Zimbabwe took part took part in the engagement they even signed the World Forest Declaration to preserve our forest and help them then currently there's an initiative to roll out the national adaptation plan so that each sub-national and each, each national department can work on climate change issues and mainstream them. As you had said that they are cross-cutting. So if you look into the first budget called Secular, produced by the Treasury last year in 2022, it called for mainstreaming of climate change and disaster risk management across all government ministries, departments and agencies to show that the government is doing all it can. And I believe, yes, we can say Zimbabwe is doing much to be there. Um, Shingi, uh, uh, paint a picture for us, okay? Where are we likely to be in the next five years? If we do things right, number one. Number two, if we don't do things right. Okay, in the next five years, yeah, probably it might be a short period of time, but if the if we persist with the way we are doing things, or as business as usual, as he was saying, things are going to to be really harsh for us. Like we mentioned earlier on, that with climate change we talk of extreme weather. So, in the next five years, if we keep on doing what we are doing right now, uh, emitting uh, a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and doing nothing to to absorb those greenhouse gases we are going to to suffer if i may put it that way through those uh, harsh weather conditions we talk of the the cyclones the heat waves the droughts so if we keep on or if we persist doing what we are doing uh, at the moment doing nothing to reduce uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases then things are going to be harsh for us but if we then try to to make an effort to reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that we are emitting as well as uh to increase our carbon sequestration, I think things might be might be different to to a certain extent, as we can safely say. Then, uh, the, those harsh conditions, those harsh weather conditions, might be might be reduced. Though we cannot send, only say this is to our country only, since it affects our uh, uh, worldwide. It's not only particularly to Zimbabwe. If we say Zimbabwe we're emitting a lot of uh, greenhouse gases, it doesn't necessarily mean that as a Zimbabwe we are going to, to, to face uh, more impacts of climate change, but it's something that is global. So as our efforts, they are then supposed to be comprehended with the other nations as well, so that we, as, a, as global, we reduce those uh, climate, we reduce those climate impacts. That's why we talk of the conference of parties that is that is held uh, annually. It helps countries to, to, to determine the actions they are doing and what level they are, what action they are doing so that we can able to, to reduce the, the, the greenhouse gases. So it's not only up to us as Zimbabwe as a nation, but it's also the contribution of other, other parties as well. So in as much as we do our work here in Zimbabwe, we are also supposed to then be working with other countries as well so that we we try to mitigate and reduce the the impacts of climate change Natinasha, has there been any work that is being done by um say the region um, together not zimbabwe alone but say the sadic region is there any plans or are the people working together uh, towards something like that yes definitely um if you note, for most of the climate outlooks, there's what is called the SACOF. 
Southern African Region Climate Outlook Forum, where all countries come together. If you look, Comesa has been doing so many meetings and there's been knowledge sharing and there's been even experience sharing by the countries in the region at large. There's even integrated planning, if you look at the planning that is done. Since we have other resources that we share, Zimbabwe and Zambia, they join hands, they take action together. So yes, we can say, even globally, there has been work that has been done. As I said, that on the Paris Agreement, it's worldwide. And the developed countries, they are the ones who caused more emissions when they were developing. So the, developed can the developing countries, they have to develop. So for one to develop, there has to be more emissions, right? But that's where the mitigation comes, using the low emission development strategy, so that we emit and reach our development targets and we reduce those emissions from the business as usual scenario. So if you look, there's also even partnership projects that have been done. If you look, um, there are some solar plants that are being put. If you look, there are um, joint efforts being done in the region. Mm. Uh, you, you spoke about the developed world. Yes. Um, Shingi, uh, are they contributing um, towards what we are doing? It, it, it could be um, maybe in terms of funding, it could be maybe in terms of um, um, ideas of how we can best achieve what we want to achieve here. So yes, they are contributing, as we were saying that the annual conference of parties that is done, they come in and bring their, their technology, their knowledge that we can tap into and come back with, with it to use as our, as our countries, the, the developing countries. Yes, they have caused more harm through their, develop, their development. But then they are admitting to it. They they know they did a greater part cause in this climate change, and they are owning up to to it through some funds that they are sending through grants, as well as uh, information exchange, even technology exchange. So, yeah, we can safely say that they are owning up and they are helping to 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 a certain extent. Mm. Yeah, I think I think I can just add something else. Sure. So. The worst part about climate change is the developing countries that the least emitters, but we have high vulnerability. Um, taking an example is Zimbabwe, we are an agro-based uh, economy. Zimbabwe is agro-based region, and we use rain-fed irrigation, rain-fed rainfall for most of our crops. So now we are saying with climate change, we used to know that rain would start to come in October or November. It's coming in December and there's dry spills and elicization of rain. So we are now the most vulnerable. We are more prone to suffer more than the developed countries because they have um, their mitigation measures in, in, in place and they have a high development. So it, it knows no boundary. That's why there is need for a collective approach. As they emit more, they should cover more. During the COP, uh, the previous COP, there was the talks of the loss and damage fund, which we hope if it comes to life, things will move because they emitted more, and, but us as developing countries, we are suffering more. So it will be a consensus so that they cover up for the gap because there's the technology and infrastructural gap that needs to be covered for us to mitigate fully to get to where we want and who has to be responsible and obviously it has to be the developed countries because when they develop they cause those emissions and they are the ones that we are also suffering from mm. yeah um shingi let me take you back to the policy is the policy that is in place currently in zimbabwe adequate so with policies at the moment they will be adequate based on the the scientific evidence that that will be present at the moment so we can safely say, based with the information that we have and based with the science that is that has been done, for now the policies are are, are working. They are working. They are their part or they are doing their part. But we also believe that with time, they they need to be revised as we will be using more technology. We will be getting more information. We will be getting uh, several different aspects than we are having at the moment. So I believe that the ones that we have at the moment, yeah, if we follow them and if we are to own up to them, as a nation, we are on the path to, to go somewhere as well as to, to meet our NDC targets. I believe if we really follow the, these policies that we have in place, all will be well. Let, let's go back to the science. Um, Tinashe, the, the, the Shingi was talking about the science. Yes. 
are the researches widely circulated? And let me add, are they in everyday language? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, they are widely circulated, but uh, maybe on the type of audience. We have a different type of audience. So the message is to be unpacked to fit to all the people. So for the scientific side, there is what is called the subsidiary body for technical assistance, SABSTA. So in the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it governs all climate change. The research and the, it's the body that governs all that is done. They follow standards. So for Zimbabwe, when you are doing your reports, there's an international standard that is there. But we put our national input. And it's nationally determined. So from those research that you do as a country, you develop your nationally determined, national determination to reduce your emissions. So I can say, yes, the science is there. But the message now, it might need to have a different way of unpacking, maybe to use more cartoons, then you have your billboards that are there, then you also have your social media, your videos, then the message would go everywhere. But the other thing is with science, you have to read to understand science. So if you are someone who doesn't like to read, yes, you won't get the hardcore science that is there. But mm -hmm. to understand the general of the processes that are happening, I believe that is being done. And it might take also, it's a two-way process. So there's need for the reader to have more effort to read more, to understand more. And even the one who is sending out the message, they might need to also have more effort to have it is something that is simple. Because as an example is by saying Zimbabwe is high vulnerability, right? An example would be if you are now to decode the message, you'll be saying if you do not adapt and mitigate, you now expect that you now explain that we are a rain agriculture based economy and we most farmers rely on rain fed rain fed agriculture so that's just explaining what vulnerability so there's need now to unpack using the multi stakeholder platforms that are there and engage the message in any ways that it can diffuse to reach out to everyone mm -hmm. um take us to the possible solutions um i know we touched on them um, earlier on when you're talking about my backyard garden and, and, and just planting trees what other solutions are there to tackle climate change, Abshigit? Firstly, uh, let's raise awareness that climate change is there and it's real. We, as we move around the, the nation... Let, let, me, let me hold you there. Let me hold you there. I, I, I like that we need to raise awareness. Whose baby is it? Because the way I see things is a lot of us leave this stuff to the government mm. whose baby is it to make sure that we raise awareness are we going to wait for the government to do that Who, whose baby is it i believe it's everyone's baby like we were saying that it's affecting everyone and everyone has a role to play so it's not something that we only leave to to the government to to make some decisions or to formulate some policies so that we'll be able to act on them but it was starting from the policymakers to the industry, going back to the communities, to the individuals. It's everyone's duty to to do something in order to to curb climate change, in order to to adapt, to mitigate. So it's not a uh, a one person thing or it's not a one sector thing, but it's supposed to be a a whole thing that is done by everyone from each and every sector from each and every level so it's not something that is to believe to the government only but us as individuals we are supposed to do something for us to to act on climate change that's why we are saying let's raise awareness so as organizations they are there they are raising awareness wherever they are going so that people really understand the effects the impacts of climate change and how is Zimbabwe have been affected so if you raise awareness an ordinary person can then be able to understand can then be able to fully know that it is there and he or she has a part to play in order to to keep the impacts of climate change so raising awareness is the number one thing as you were saying prior that is the science able to be understood by a ordinary citizen they cannot fully understand until there are someone that is there to able to to teach them 
to unpack it and probably to put it in vernacular as well so that people really understand and know their, their role to play and engage in, in this um, collective approach in tackling climate change. So number one thing that is supposed to be done is to, to raise awareness so that people understand, so that people act on it. Because with this also, it's a matter of behavioral change. So if we do not change our behavior through what we do as business as usual scenarios, things are going to be harsh for us. So if we are able to raise awareness, we change that behavior that we are living with. I think that is the, the first steps that we are supposed to take as we are to, to proceed with the uh, with curbing of climate change. I'm sure Tinashe can then add on, on other aspects that can be done. Tinashe, before you yeah. come in, I want to, to add this one to you. Okay. They say catch them young, right? Yes. Has there been anything done to make sure that perhaps the, 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 the kids in school start to learn about this so that it becomes more of a culture? I know that back home, you 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 have my, my little daughter singing Musara Sire Marara Pese Pese. What is there anything that has been done to make sure that you uh, capture that young audience? Okay, so starting off maybe from government level, if you look at the education curriculum, climate change was mainstreamed in the education curriculum. So it means when children are learning, they learn climate change, they know what to do. Then if you look at even our development partners, they've been there in the schools, they are there. Even uh, volunteer organizations and people, they are there. So I can say, yes, they are there. You see, there are even it's a competitions that were done. Last year, there was the Stockholm 50th conference. There was an annual conference done by the Minister of Environment, UNICEF, uh, UNEP, and the Swedish Embassy, where there was a national competi competition that was submitted to EMA, where people sent their essays to their headmasters. So each school, they actually shows that schools are there, the children are there, and they actually led. Some of them had some paintings that were there that were given to the international platforms to say, look at these ones, they are sharing the message using multimedia. If you look even at the skits that are there, the videos on TikTok, some will speak of climate change, even on Facebook, some will have their blogs on climate change. So I believe the young are there and they are engaged in climate issues. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. I have learned. I have learned. I hope um, even the listener has learned a thing or two. I'm going to be making sure that I uh, plant trees as much as possible and yeah. of, of course have a, a, a green a garden. Uh, but before I, I let you go to your final remarks, there is a message here from one of our listeners. Um, this one reads, I don't think we understand our plight in this climate change situation. We as Africa emit less than 4% of global emissions. We are the ones suffering the most. We shouldn't focus on emissions or carbon footprint because the culprits actually surpass us substantially in terms of volume emissions. It's been like that for decades. So developed countries shouldn't encourage us. They should be the ones taking action. Variquite evil. Investment in oil and gas is increasing in those countries, while our droughts, floods and hunger are increasing. We should be focusing on holding them accountable if they don't implement their obligations in the Paris Climate Agreement. Let's stop smiling when they try to calm us down with aid or investment. Even their green energy thrust through cobalt and lithium mining is causing environmental damage and health risk to Africa. Let's be practical. <laughs> Thank you so very much yeah, uh, yeah. For, for that one. Um, let, let, me, let me throw it back to you, gentlemen. Let me start with Shingi. <laughs> What's your take? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very true. We are contributing, as Africa, we say, we are contributing very minimal to, to the emissions that are being emitted in the atmosphere, but we are the most vulnerable. So we can then not safely say, let's then sit back. We are not the ones who are causing this, but we are the ones that are being affected. So we are supposed to act. Yes, we're supposed to hold them accountable. They, uh, that's why uh, last year, as Tinashe was saying, there was a uh, finance on loss and damage that the developed countries, they are then supposed to fund us as the African nations or the developing countries for us to implement adaptation uh, strategies for us to be able to, 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 to live with climate change, for us to be able to not being affected 
uh, to a greater extent with these effects of climate change. So yes, we are not supposed to, to sit around and smile with them since they are the ones they are causing and that's very true. There is a lot of uh, mining in oil and gas exploration that are being done up there. So yes, they, we know that, that they are causing, but we cannot then safely say, yeah, let us do nothing. But we are supposed to, to put pressure on them, do something, act on what they, they agreed. As we are saying on the NDCs, they also have their NDCs that they are supposed to submit and they are supposed to be held accountable on those if they are meeting those uh, the contributions that they said they, they are going to meet. Um, Tinashe. Yes. Are these development, uh, developed countries rather doing enough in their respective parts of the world in trying to curb? Because we may be faced with a situation whereby they're happy to give us some money to do something, but they keep on doing whatever they've been doing, so it might not help. Are they doing enough? Um, if it's either a yes or a no, I would say a no, because they have not committed to this, what is called the Green Climate Fund. So the developed countries, they committed the pledge to give 100 billion so that we use it to have uh, technological and financial and technical assistance as developing countries. But that money, they did not produce that 100 billion per year. And I actually concur with what the, the listener sent, the text that was sent, to say they have to be accountable. So they actually said that they will give the resources which then did not come as 100 billion. And on that note also, the other challenge is to tap into those resources now. It's also a challenge. You need a number of experts, there's a number of procedures and feasibility studies which require more resources for you to have them as a measure to access those resources. So I would just say the developed countries, they have to do more. What they are doing is not enough. Thank you so very much, uh, gentlemen. I'm going to have to let you go. But before I do that, I would like to have uh, parting shots from you. Uh, let's start with um, Shingi, your parting shots. I would say climate change is real. Let's act now. Tinashe? Yeah. Then let's plant trees and also behavioral change is good. And time for climate action is now. Thank you so very much, um, uh, gentlemen. Uh, that was um, um, the exchange where we were discussing and unpacking evidence of climate change in Zimbabwe. I was joined by Shingi Nelson Machaka from Sustainable Climate Action Trust, as well as Tinashe Mangosho, who is a climate change uh, expert. Uh, gentlemen, once again, uh, thank you so very much for joining us on Capital 100.4 FM. My name is Mike Zinduro, and our time is exactly four minutes before uh, the hour of eight. Uh, stay tuned, uh, stay locked on on Capital Talk 100 on Vore FM. It's a happiness all day long on the happy station. Capital 100 on 4 FM.